in front of you. Uh, I've, I will probably be regularly providing a copy of it in the back by where the bulletins are, or if you prefer to use your own Bibles, that's fine, or your, the Bible on your phone, whatever, but I highly, highly, highly suggest that you have access to it. And uh, again, our passage this week comes immediately following Jesus' baptism. Uh, last week, if you remember, uh, the passage of Scripture that we were looking at ended with Jesus being baptized. Um, he had been baptized by John the Baptist, his namesake. He was, uh, Jesus was praying, remember Je the scene? Jesus was praying, the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and God the Father said, You are my Son, whom, I'm, whom I love, with you I am well pleased. And if you remember from last week, up until this point, Jesus hadn't done really anything as far as earthly ministry goes. Up until this point in the Gospel of Luke, we've seen lots and lots of build-up about who Jesus was and, you know, what he could be. You know, angels have come, like we've seen angels come and talk to people. We've seen people have suddenly prophetic messages, suddenly people just speak out these prophetic messages about Jesus. You know, lots of things have pointed to Jesus being very special. But as we shall see, he is now about 30 years old, and from all we can tell, he's lived a pretty normal life for the past 30 years. He's all grown up. He's probably spent the last decade plus working in the trade of his father, and all the while, though, conducting himself in a manner that is pleasing to God. Of course, Jesus never sinned. He was always um, without sin, so he somehow managed to work a blue-collar job and never sin. That's quite the accomplishment if you've ever worked in a blue-collar job like I have. Uh, but now he is about to begin his public ministry. He's been baptized, he's been approved and affirmed by God, and it would seem like the most natural thing to do would be to have him go on and just get down to business, just get down to ministry. But instead, before he can get going, his old enemy shows up to try and destroy his ministry before it even begins. The passage that we're going to be looking at today, of course, is the account of the trials and temptations that Jesus endured in the wilderness at the hands of the devil. And what the enemy goes after, what the devil goes after, are the very words that we just heard God speak. God just said, you are my son, and that is what the devil goes after. Now, we, we, the reader, are, we're about to see Jesus' genealogy, which shows us just how Jesus, through his human line, is God's son. And God just spoke from heaven, affirming that he is God's son. And the enemy is about to go to war at, on Jesus' status as God's son. And it's quite the thought, isn't it? The idea of Jesus facing off against the devil, against the very one who is responsible for all the mess that the world is in. You know, who's responsible for why Jesus has become human in the first place. You know, I can't help but wonder what that moment was like when they first encountered one another in the wilderness, like when they first locked eyes with each other. You know, up to this point, a large part of what has been going on in the Bible has been God's people versus the devil's people. You know, occasionally God has been directly involved, like when he struck Egypt with the ten plagues or when he parted the Red Sea. You know, God got directly involved there. But other times, God chose to work through the obedience of his followers. Think of something like David and Goliath. God didn't kill Goliath, David did, but God was working through David. One thing that the Bible has never spoken on up to this point is God taking the devil head on. So far, it's been the forces of God versus the forces of the enemy. But now, God and the enemy are going to have it out themselves. The conflict has finally reached its climax. You know, in war, the leaders lead until the fighting has reached a climax, a decision point. Either one side has prevailed over the other or they come to a draw. Then the leaders meet to finalize what has occurred and then the conflict is over. We see this in sports as well. You know, once the game has begun, the coaches on the opposing teams, they don't interact with each other. They only interact with each other once the game is over, then they interact with each other once, something ha once an outcome has been decided. But, you know, our human analogies can only go so far, right? Because, like, especially with something like sports, the stakes aren't that high. You know, with sports, there's a lot of money on the line, but everyone stays civil. You know, even in warfare, 
once the outcome has been decided, the outcome of a war like World War II or something. The leaders of the armed forces of the opposing sides are often civil with each other while they negotiate terms of peace. But when the creator of the universe goes head to head with the one who wants to subjugate and enslave the universe, the stakes are a bit higher, aren't they? You know, with our own interpersonal conflicts, we can often live and let live, as they say. We can go on with life and move on to other things. But with Jesus and the devil, there is no live and let live. There is no moving on. There is no neutral ground. The only possible resolution to this conflict really is total annihilation of someone. Someone. Because Jesus and the devil cannot coexist together forever. The stakes are as high as they could possibly be. And at stake is the fate and future of humanity and the security of the universe. And how will Jesus handle the attacks and thwart the plans of the enemy? Let's find out. Luke chapter 3, verse 23. And I'll be reading to chapter 4, verse 15. So Jesus, when he began his, er his ministry, was about 30 years old. He was the son, as was supposed, of Joseph, son of Heli, son of Matthet, the son of Levi, son of Melchi, the son of Jan Jani, the son of Joseph, the son of Matthias, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, the son of Esli, the son of Nagai, the son of Maath, the son of Matathias, the son of Simeon, the son of Joseph, the son of Jodah, the son of Joannan, the son of Resha, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the son of Neri, the son of Melchi, the son of Adi, the son of Qasim, the son of El-Madam, El the son of Ur, the son of Joshua, the son of El-Eazer, the son of Jorim, the son of Matthat, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonam, the son of el El Eakim, the son of Mela, Melia, the son of Mena, the son of Mattatha, the son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Salah, the son of Nashon, the son of Aminadab, the son of Admin, the son of Arni, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Serug, the son of Reu, the son of Peleg, the son of Eber, the son of she Shelah, the son of Canaan, the son of Arphaxed, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enosh, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalalel, the son of Ken Kenan, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Do you think it was important to Luke that he showed that Jesus was the son of God? He just said, he just had God say, you are my son, and he just proved how he was his God's son. Then Jesus, chapter 4 now, verse 1. Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he endured temptations from the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and when they were completed, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, you know, keep in mind what we just read and how long that took and how difficult it was, command this stone to become bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, Man does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up to a high place and showed him in a flash all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, To you I will grant this whole realm and the glory that goes along with it. For it has been relinquished to me, and I can give it to anyone I wish. So then, if you will worship me, all this will be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, You are to worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil brought him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and with their hands they will lift you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, You are not to put the Lord your God to the test. So when the devil had completed every temptation, he departed from him until a more opportune time. Then Jesus, in the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and news about him spread throughout the, the surrounding countryside. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by all. And that's how far we'll read the word of the Lord. You know, this is one of those stories in the Bible that can spark a lot of questions and speculations, and naturally so. I mean, if Jesus is going head-to-head -head with the 
if Jesus is going, it's Jesus, sorry, it's Jesus going head to head with the devil. I just said in the introduction that these two, like they cannot coexist together. The universe is literally not big enough for the both of them. That's not a hyperbole. So with that in mind, you know, this battle that they have here seems, I guess you could say, maybe restrained on the part of both parties involved. You know, why aren't we seeing some kind of like epic battle that takes place, like what we see in movies today? It's a bit odd because, you know, I most certainly believe that what I had said was true. These, are, these two are there for the sole purpose of annihilating each other. That's what they're there for. But it seems like there's a reason they can't just, you know, have it out right then and there. You know, there seem to be rules to what they can and can't do. There seems to be a standard to which they are both appealing to. And I believe from what we see here that that standard is God. They are both subject to God and God's laws and God's order. Jesus is because he's God's son. And the devil is because he's a created being. Now, how do we know that this is the case? Well, we can see it in how, they, how their interactions play out. You know, throughout the encounter, as we will see, the enemy is attempting to get Jesus to question God to second-guess God's decisions. And Jesus counters this by reaffirming his commitment to God and God's will and God's word. Because remember, Jesus is here in this situation by the will of God, by God's decision. We just read in chapter 4, verse 1, that the Spirit led him into the wilderness, and in the wilderness, Jesus isn't having a good time, is he? He's, he hasn't eaten anything. He's being tempted by the enemy. And this goes on for 40 days. And through it all, Jesus remained in total submission to God's will. And what does the enemy do? He looks for a way to trip Jesus up, to get Jesus to do something that would betray a feeling of doubt or resentment for what God has called him to do. And why is he doing that? Well, because, you know, the enemy himself, he has no authority in and of himself to make Jesus or God do anything. You know, he's not the lawgiver. He's not the one who decided how the universe would be run. When someone does something wrong, they're not rebelling against the enemy. It's not his rules that are being broken. So even if he were to succeed in tempting Jesus to sin or rebel, he still wouldn't be able to do anything about it. If Jesus had turned the stones into bread, what's that to the devil? Why would he care? Well, I don't think he really did care whether or not Jesus turned stones into bread. It's not about that, I don't think. What he was trying to get Jesus to do was he was trying to get Jesus to alter his present situation to better accommodate his own personal needs and desires, to put his will and desires above God's will and desires. Mary said he was famished, he was hungry. It was God's will that Jesus would be there at that moment experiencing those things. And the enemy was tempting Jesus to question it. To question whether or not God really was a loving father. It's the same thing that the devil did to Eve in the garden. You know, the devil, he, did, he didn't tell Eve to disobey God. He let her make that decision herself. He just gave her a nudge in that direction. He planted a little seed of doubt in God's ability to have Eve's best interest in mind, and he suggested that she take action to alter her situation and pursue a course that would make her life better. And he's doing the same thing here with Jesus. You know, he, like I said, he has no authority to do anything to Jesus, just like he had no authority to do anything to Adam and Eve while they were in the garden. All he could do was tempt them to make the wrong decision themselves. And for Jesus, the wrong decision would be to display a lack of trust in God's ability to care for him as his beloved son. And this is at the core, really, of all three trials that we read about in this passage. You know, God has just called Jesus his beloved son, and now he is in a state of suffering that, up to this point, I would probably guess that Jesus has never experienced suffering like this before. Now, we've touched on the first trial, turning the stones into bread. If Jesus had turned stones into bread, it would have shown that he didn't trust God to provide for his physical needs. Jesus overcame that by stating, man does not live by bread alone. Physical discomfort is not the end of the world. God is still a loving God even when we experience physical discomfort. Now, how about the other two trials? Well, the second one really trips people up because, you know, even for the devil, it seems a bit too far. It seems a step too far to offer Jesus 
who created the world to right, the right to rule over the kingdoms of the world. You know, it, it seems like it would be as if someone came up to me and said, you know, like, Stephen, Stephen, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you the right to be the father to your children. Like, you can't offer me what you don't have. I alone retain the right to be the father of my children. No one else can offer it to me. So with the devil's offer to Jesus, you know, you know, what's going on? Is this a bluff? Is this a lie? It's most certainly in the devil's nature to lie. So is this what's going on? Like, what, like why would he offer Jesus this? Well, before we write this off as being a poor attempt on the enemy's part, let me just ask you a question. You know, in this situation, do you really think that the enemy would make a blunder like this? Do you really think that the enemy is so naive or short-sighted as to make a blunder and uh, have a weak argument? I submit to you that, you know, when the enemy faces off with Jesus, like it's Jesus he's going after, he brings his A game. He brings the best of his arsenal. Let me ask you another question. If this were a bluff, like if the devil is bluffing Jesus here, if he didn't have anything to offer Jesus, would Jesus ever fall for it? You know, let's go back to the example of me and my children. Could I ever be bluffed into thinking that someone else held the right to be the father to my children? You know, I don't care how much confidence someone has. I don't care how tired and hungry I might be. No one would ever be able to bluff me into thinking that, I, that they had the right to my children and that I had to earn it from them. Never. That would never, ever happen. So I have difficulty in imagining that Jesus wouldn't be the same way with his right to rule over the kingdoms of the earth. There's just no way Jesus could be bluffed or tricked into thinking that he had to earn something like this if he, had, if he already had the right to it. There's just no way that the enemy just took a bad shot. There's just no way that the enemy just made a bad blunder. He's too smart for that, and the stakes are too high for that. They're not messing around here. So what is going on? Well, what if the offer was genuine? And how could it be? You know, we just read, I just read Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. There we go. God as creator of the universe has the sole right to rule the universe as he sees fit. And no one can take that from him. How could someone take that from him? He did it himself. However, one thing that God as ruler and creator of the universe decided to do was have his creation be a worshiping creation. You know, he made us in such a way that we desire to worship. And we all worship something, you know, whether it's, uh, whether it's the God of the Bible, as we should, or whether it's nature, or whether it's a certain kind of philosophy, a worldview. We all ascribe goodness and power to something. Well, one thing that was very common for ancient peoples back then to worship was what they observed in the natural world because there are aspects of the natural world that seem very powerful. And in the Bible, we see God warning his people Israel to not give in to the temptation to worship the things around them. But in the, in the warning to Israel, God also says what has happened to the other nations, to the other kingdoms of the earth. We read this in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 19 through 20. This is God speaking to Israel through his prophet Moses. Deuteronomy 4, this is God speaking, says, And when you look up to the sky and see the sun, the moon and the stars, all the heavenly array, do not be enticed into bowing down to them and worshiping them, worshiping things the Lord your God has apportioned to all the nations under heaven. As for you, the Lord took you and brought you out of the iron-smelting furnace, out of Egypt, to be a people of his inheritance, as you now are. So here we can see that God has apportioned or allocated or assigned or even given over to the nations the worship of the heavenly array. God, in his authority, gave them over to that false form of worship. It was his choice. And of course, behind every false form of worship is the power of the enemy, drawing them in so that they would be further drawn further away from God. And why would God do this? Well, because he wants genuine followers. He wants genuine relationship, not robots. And the nations throughout the Old Testament, you know, the nations other than Israel, made it clear that they prefer to worship the created things rather than the creator. 
So God gave them what they wanted. And what they wanted ultimately was to worship and serve the enemy. God gave the kingdoms of the world over to the powers of evil that are in rebellion against him. And in doing so, he gave the powers of evil the right to rule over the kingdoms of the earth. And the devil says in this passage in Luke, you know, it has been relinquished to him. That's what the enemy says to Jesus. He's saying to Jesus, it has been relinquished to me. If that wasn't true, don't you think Jesus would have challenged him on that point? You know, if anyone can make the devil honest, it's Jesus. Can the devil really lie in the face of Jesus like that? I don't think that there's any attempt at deception here because this is something that Jesus couldn't be deceived about. Jesus knew very well how things were because Jesus made them how they are. I think that this could be a genuine offer. The devil is willing to give up all the glory he gets from being worshipped by the kingdoms of the earth in exchange for the glory he would get for being worshipped by Jesus, the creator worshipping the created. And, you know, that's an extremely offensive thought, isn't it? But really, we look out in the world today, and as we look into our own hearts, we know that we all desire the praise of the universe. We all like the idea of being the object of adoration and worship. You know, Jesus' words to the devil apply to us as well. You are to worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And finally, the third trial. The third trial. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here because, you know, doesn't the Bible say that you are under angelic protection? Doesn't the Bible say that you can do anything you like and the angels will protect you? And I, I, when I was reading this, I couldn't help but think of that uh, flagpole scene in the Christmas, in that Christmas movie, The Christmas Story. It's like, I triple dog dare you. Go ahead and do it, Jesus. You know, are these just playground antics? Like, what, what's going on here? Well, I think the enemy is again testing Jesus to see just how loyal Jesus is to God and his will. God didn't send Jesus into the world to be a magician or to be an acrobat. The goal and purposes of what Jesus came to do did not include displays of divine showmanship. When Jesus did do miracles, it was always for the purpose of displaying that God's kingdom was breaking into the world, that God was on the move in renewing and rebuilding the things that were once broken by evil. Jesus being floated safely to, ground, to the ground by the angels did not serve that purpose. It, it just didn't. You know, in taking, what we, in taking what he learned from the encounter, you know, the devil departs and regroups. You know, after this, we're not going to see him again until it's time for Jesus to die. And Jesus, having passed all the tests, now he begins his ministry in earnest. And it seems so hopeful at the beginning, doesn't it? Our passage ends with him teaching in their synagogues and being praised by all. It's wonderful. But that's all about to change real fast. Uh, when we come back next week, Jesus is going to anger the people of his hometown, Nazareth, so badly that they're going to try to throw him off a cliff. And I mean literally, I'm not kidding. They are going to try to throw Jesus off a cliff, and it's going to happen next week. So brace yourselves, because we're going to experience a bit of whiplash. It's going really, really well right now, and it's going to go really badly next week. But for now, let's leave Jesus. Let's leave him in this moment of triumph. You know, he just came through the most difficult part of his life up to that point, and he's experiencing a great and fruitful ministry, and that's going to be where we end it today. And what can we learn from this? Well, it's that... What we can learn is that our relationship with God is defined by our relationship with God. Our relationship with God is not defined by our ability to answer the challenges of the devil. You know, for those of us who are followers of Jesus, we cherish our status as God's children. You know, Jesus taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven. And if there's one thing that is of the utmost importance for understanding our relationship with God... It's that it is based on unmerited favor. We do not in any way earn or deserve the love and favor that God shows us. It's unmerited. But, when, but we get tripped up by God's call in our lives to act in such a way as and do certain things that are looked upon with favor by God. And, give, and you know, we can do things that give God a reason to bless us. You know, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount... But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be done in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. So there are things we can do 
to have God give us favor. But this gets twisted by the enemy. You know, the enemy knows perfectly well what God wants from us. You know, it's no secret to the enemy what God wants from us. And the enemy is very skilled and practiced at distracting us from the goal of our actions. And that is having a relationship with God. And the enemy is very good at making it about something that is so similar that it can look like the same thing. And that is maintaining our relationship with God. You see the difference between having a relationship with God and maintaining a relationship with God. Again, at the foundation of our relationship with God, we receive his unmerited favor. We as followers of Jesus have something we didn't earn. We couldn't earn it. We could never earn it. But God wanted to give it to us. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were in our sin, Jesus died for us. Jesus made the way for us to be God's children. Galatians 3, verse 26 through 27 says, So in Christ Jesus, you all are children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. This is something that is beyond us but in grace was given to us. And since it is beyond us, it is beyond our ability to maintain it. The last thing the enemy wants us to do is be secure and comfortable with where we are as followers of Jesus. He would much rather we live in a state of constantly feeling guilty and inadequate and in search of some way to overcome those feelings. But the Bible tells us very clearly that we are guilty. We are inadequate. And in love, Jesus came and died for us anyway. You know, we don't need to overcome our feelings of guilt and inadequacy. Indeed, we won't know and we won't understand what Jesus did for us until we embrace just how guilty and inadequate we've always been. Because remember remember Jesus' parable about the debts. You know, Jesus said one person owed a small debt, one person owed a large debt. Who would be more grateful when the debts are forgiven? Of course, the person who owed a large debt would be the most grateful. And the enemy makes us afraid of just how large our debt is, distracting us from the fact that it has already been written off. Our debt was very, very real, but what Jesus did for us is also very real. And of course, the danger of embracing this freedom we now have because of Jesus is that, you know, we might feel free to go on sinning, right? The Apostle Paul talks about this. But let me ask you, If that is your attitude, what reason does God have to give you any further blessings? Again, our relationship with God is based on our relationship with God. And treating the sacrifice of Jesus as your get-out-of-jail-free card shows that you have really no desire to have a close personal relationship with God. And the true desire of your heart isn't hidden from him. Instead, you know, like Jesus, we are to stand firmly and confidently on who we are before God not allowing the enemy to make us either be guilty or feel guilty. It's a, fi- it's a fine balance, and it's a difficult balance that can only be accomplished by knowing who we are before God. If you are a follower of Jesus, then you are God's child, and God cares for his children as a good father. You know, sometimes we might be hungry and tired. Sometimes we might be drawn to the opportunity to be praised and worshiped. Sometimes we might be guilt-tripped into proving that God loves us. You know, like, do this, and that way you know God loves you. But if we stand firm on God and seek his will above all else, all those things will be shown for what they are. They are a distraction meant to plant doubt and suspicion in our minds and hearts and make us wonder if God really has things under control. Does God really have his love for me under control? Trust me, he has his love for you under control. We don't have to try to manipulate it. God does have things under control. God does know what our needs are, what our desires are, what our plans are. God's not a killjoy that just wants to ruin our fun. He's a loving Father who knows what is best for us. And what is best for us above everything else is being in relationship with him. That is what he wants. God wants us to be in relationship with him. So that is what we can have. We can always have relationship with him. You know, that's something that the enemy can never take away from us. We are secure in the Father's love. And we can go out in confidence just like Jesus did. And when the enemy comes and tries to trip us up, it would be great if you guys could quote scripture to him because the enemy 
You're like, if you can use scripture wisely, all the better. But if nothing else, stand firm in your status as his child. Because he loves you. There's nothing the enemy could say to you to change that. Let's pray. Father God, as we come before you today, let's pray that you fill our hearts with the assurance of your love for us. Lord, you always loved your son, and yet your son at times was called to do very, very difficult things. But those very difficult things does not mean that you loved him any less. Lord, I pray that you give us that confidence. I pray that you give us a desire for your word, because in your word is your truth. And the more we take in your truth, the more we can stand firmly on it. Lord, bless us as we go into this week. Protect us and bring us all back here safely on your day, on your Lord's day again next week. We ask these things in your name. Amen.